Hello and welcome to Puffin Virtually Live presents Jacqueline Wilson's Big Picnic. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I'm Simon Mayo and it's my privilege to host today's event with one of the nation's favourite authors, Dame Jacqueline Wilson. Jacqueline's books are loved by young readers not only in the UK but all over the world. She's written close to 100 books which have sold more than 30 million copies in the UK alone. Her books have also been translated into 32 different languages and she has won many, many awards for her writing. Today, Jacqueline will be talking about her children's book, Four Children and It, and also about a very popular writer called Edith Nesbitt, who was born 155 years ago. Nesbitt wrote a book called Five Children and It, and Jacqueline loved the book so much, she decided to write her own modern version about it. We're talking to you live from the Tudor Barn in the grounds of Well Hall in Royal Greenwich, where Nesbitt used to live. And on screen now, you can see a picture of what her house used to look like. We also have a live audience of some children from local Greenwich schools who now want to wave and say hello. There you go. That's them. Uh, they will also be enjoying a big picnic with us uh, at the end of the event. And of course, uh, we're also joined by you, our online viewers. So a big warm welcome to all of you. And I hope you've all brought some picnic food so you can enjoy it with your friends uh, once we're finished with you uh, here. I'm going to chat with Jacqueline in just a moment, but wanted to remind you that you can send in your questions for Jacqueline throughout the course of the event via the Puffin Virtually Live website and the email is on your screen. Jacqueline will aim to answer as many of them as possible in the time that we have towards the end of the, ev uh, towards the, end of the event. But without further ado, please, a very, very big welcome to Dame Jacqueline Wilson. Thanks for coming. <coughs> Hi, everybody. Good morning, Jacqueline. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, fantastic to talk to you. Very, very exciting day, an exciting book. But first of all, we'll start at the beginning. Tell us about E. Nesbitt. What do we need to know? Okay. Edith Nesbitt was one of my most favourite writers when I was young. Um, she lived a long time ago, 155 years ago to this day she was born. Um, she was the most jolly, unconventional woman. Um, when she lived here, she put on all sorts of fun and games and charades for the children. She always had different ideas and um, I would have loved to have known her. She, she had her hair cut off very short before before this was at all fashionable. Um, she wore long flowing robes and she also had a lot of silver jewellery. Does that remind you of anybody? And she wrote wonderful books for children. Um, the first book I read of hers was called The Treasure Seekers and I love that one. She wrote a creepy book called The Enchanted Castle. Um, she wrote a book that I'm sure you'll know about, The Railway Children, fantastic film too. And she wrote my absolute all-time favorite children's book, Five Children and It. Now, why is it your favorite book? And it's a strange title. You're obviously drawn in to do your own modern version of it, but what was it about that story which made you want to go and have a look at it again? Well, I love Five Children in It. <clears throat> Certainly it's got a wonderful title and it's about, as you would expect, five children. There's Cyril, Robert, Anthea and Jane and then the very little brother who's nicknamed the Lamb because Bar was the first word he said. And although when you read Five Children and It you can see that they're Edwardian children and they might dress in pinafores and strange trousers and look very different. The moment you start reading the book you understand they're real children. They squabble, they have fun, they do all sorts of naughty things. But so in some ways it's a very realistic story but it's also a fantasy story because these children discover a magic, very, very elderly, he's practically prehistoric creature called the Sand Fairy. His actual proper title is the Samiad. And they dig him up out of the gravel pit and he can grant wishes every day. And when I was a child, I thought how wonderful to be able to, to find this Samiad and to, to have whatever you want to wish for. And, um, and then as an adult, 
somebody said to me, you know, would you ever like to write a story that is sort of a, a sequel or a prequel to a children's classic? And I thought of five children in it. And I thought, I won't actually write exactly as E. Nesbitt wrote. I don't want to copy her style. What I will do, though, I will invent my own four children and I will borrow this magic sand fairy, the Samiad. And I don't think Edith Nesbitt would mind because sometimes when she was writing books, she would take an idea or two from other children's writers and always acknowledged it cheerfully. So if, she's, if her ghost is sort of floating around anywhere, I'm sure she'll be smiling at me today. And how, how do your children differ from the ones in the original? My children are very much the sort of children that I like to write about. So the story is meant to be written by Rosalind and she's a total bookworm. I think she's rather like I was when I was a little girl. And Rosalind has a little brother, Robbie, who's a bit timid and absolutely passionate about animals. They have a stepsister, Smash, who's very shouty, very difficult, great fun to write about. And then there's a little half-sister, Maudie, who everybody loves, and um, it's just the pet of the whole family. And I decided, right, I would have these modern children, and then they have to find the Samyad. And I knew Samyads like to live in sand. And when I was a girl, I used to go to Oxshot Woods near where I lived, where there was a huge natural sand pit. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll have the children go to Oxshot Woods, have a picnic there, just as I used to, start digging and discover the Samyad for themselves. Uh, just before I ask you to, to read a section from the book, Jacqueline, just out of interest, are shouty children more fun to write than quiet children? Well, I like writing about shouty children. I, w I was quite well behaved as a little girl, but um, I think everybody likes to fantasise about what it might be like to be really naughty. Shout has reasons to be badly behaved. Um, she hasn't had the easiest upbringing, um, but she's certainly quite fearsome bossy. And for Rosalind, who's quite a, a, a quiet, well-behaved girl, it's really quite difficult for her at times. But they do, throughout the book, actually make friends. I think people are itching to uh, hear just a little bit of the book, Jacqueline. Could you choose a, a section to read from Four Children in it? Right. This is right at the beginning, when the children have just had their very first picnic in Oxshot Woods, and then they've started to dig in the sand. We all looked and saw a paw, a brown furry paw with a pink pad and neat little claws. It scrabbled frantically, attempting to cover itself with sand. Smash reached out and tried to grab it. Careful, said Robbie in such a fierce voice that Smash stopped, startled. You'll frighten it, now let me. He bent down and spoke very softly. There now, little creature, it's all right. We're not gonna hurt you. We'll let you hide away in a minute if that's what you want. We just want to check you're all right. So I'll ease the sand away here very, very carefully. Robbie exposed a short, stout, furry leg and then rather large hindquarters. Whatever is it, I said. It's a ginormous rat, said Smash. No, it's too furry, said Robbie. I think it's a meerkat. They bury themselves in sand, I said. It's too fat for a meerkat, said Robbie. I'm not sure what it is. Pussycat, pussycat, said Maudie. It hasn't got a tail, said Robbie. It's got a very big bottom, Smash shrieked. Shh. So have you, said Robbie. Now shut up, you're frightening it. There now, little creature. Can you come out just a tiny bit? The animal did its best to burrow further in, but Robbie very gently scooped the sand away from its sides and then held it firm. Come on now, I promise we won't hurt you, Robbie whispered. The legs stopped scrabbling and Robbie pulled very carefully. The creature shot right out of the sand. We stared at it, amazed. 
It was far fatter than we'd expected. It had an extremely wrinkled face with a very disgruntled expression. Its eyes were on thin stalks and wavered about, peering at us disapprovingly from its upside down position. Every single one of its whiskers was bristling. Is it a very tubby monkey, said Smash. Its face is all weird wrinkles, just like a monkey's. Monkey, said Maudie. It is a bit like a monkey, but they don't have eyes on stalks and it hasn't got a tail, Robbie whispered. I don't really know what it is. I do, I squealed. It's a Samiad. It really, truly has to be a Samiad, like the one in my book. It's exactly like that. Oh, please, are you a Samiad? Of course I am a Samiad, it said, very crossly indeed. And there's nothing wrong with my face. My wrinkles simply show my extremely distinguished age. I've always been considered an excellent specimen of my species. Now, will you kindly turn me right side up, young man? I do not care to conduct a conversation from this ludicrous position. It puts me at a total disadvantage. Very good, I think. Yeah. Fantastic. And wonderful to hear you read your words out loud. Do you enjoy still reading your works? I don't ever read my own books to myself at all. It makes me twitch and feel self-conscious and feel, oh, I wish I hadn't done it that way or this way. But when I'm doing lovely events like this and reading a little bit aloud, I do like to do that. When, when my daughter was little, I always loved to read aloud to her. So that um, I think it's a lovely way of sharing a story together. The Samyad sounds an intriguing character. Did he Nesbitt get the Samyad from somewhere else or was the Samyad entirely her creation? Um, Ines but invented him entirely herself. There was another children's writer called Louisa Molesworth and she had invented a talking creature that was a bit bad-tempered. But Edith Nesbitt's Samyad is the best, the absolute one. I mean, I think if, if I could go back into storybook times and um, meet any characters, I would love to meet the Samyad myself. And, uh, and in your book, you have your children meeting her children. That must have been strange, because these are the children that you wanted to be, that you read all those years ago. Well, I thought, because Rosalind is, is my main narrator telling the story, and she's read five children in it, and she loves it too. And so when it gets to be her turn to have a wish from the Samyad, she wishes that they could go back and meet these storybook children, because that's exactly the sort of thing that she's always loved to do. And initially, she fits in perfectly in Edwardian times. She particularly likes Edith Nesbitt's girls, Jane and, and Anthea, and um, she's interested that although they're quite big girls, I would imagine they're about 10 and 12, they still have dolls in their nursery and a doll's house. And Rosalind, you know, just thinks it's quite wonderful. You could be sort of quite babyish and nobody tease you and just enjoy playing with games. Smash loves to play war games with the Ines Brits boys and so so they have a great time so much so that Rosalind wishes that she could stay in the past and then it all starts to change because she's there on her own in the past and people think she's a very strange boy because she's dressed in jeans and they never wore jeans in, in those days. And, um, and eventually she gets put in a workhouse which is very scary and very worrying indeed. But Smash in, in modern times actually manages to make a wish and save her so that it all works out all right. What is it with picnics? There are a lot of picnics here. There are loads of picnics in this book. I, I did count them. I think there are about 10 picnics in the book. 
in absolutely described in lavish detail. I love descriptions of food in books and I love picnics. As, as a little girl, my dad probably once a year took me to Oxshot Woods for a picnic, but it was one of the highlights of my childhood. We didn't really have elaborate picnics in those days. It would be just like a cheese sandwich, an apple, half a bar of chocolate, that was it. But I thought it was absolutely splendid. We, we go to Oxshot Woods and we'd arrive there about 10 o'clock in the morning and the picnic was meant to be for our lunch but by about half past 10 we'd eaten every single little bit of it and now I still hope that somebody will invite me out for a very elaborate picnic um, I have given my best friend a picnic basket as a jokey present hoping that she might say well okay we'll we'll go off and have a picnic together she hasn't done it so far so just got to wait and see uh, scotch egg and crisps, I think, is the most important thing to have, would you say? Scotch egg and crisps, very good. Um, I like the idea of really elaborate picnics with sort of bits of chicken and lots of dips, lots of different types of sandwiches and lots of sweet things too, lots of fruit pies and puddings and little pots of cream and lots of different things to drink, all sorts of fruit. You know, I, I could have a tablecloth spread right out, absolutely covered with food. You still love your picnics. Though. I do, I do indeed. Just a word on, uh, on having your wishes granted, because the Samia doesn't quite... Wishes aren't granted in this book quite in the way that the children would like them uh, to be granted. Could you explain just a bit about that? Well, the Samyad will grant wishes, but he's very bad-tempered and grudging about it. And I rather think he deliberately makes them have slightly disastrous consequences. I expect you've heard of that old saying, be careful what you wish for. And certainly um, in both Edith Nesbitt's book and in my book, you, you, the children make all these different wishes and um, something nearly always goes wrong. Like uh, my little Robbie, he has, you know those little plastic zoo animals that you can get? He has a whole collection of these and he wishes his little zoo animals can come alive, which I thought would be great fun. But you've got a real little lion and a real little zebra together. And what do you think the lion is going to do to the zebra? So that all, all the really fierce animals have to be kept completely separate from the quiet, docile animals. And they wriggle around and they all want different sorts of habitat. And it's really quite a headache. And then when, when little Maudie, she's allowed a turn at wishing and she's at the nursery rhyme stage. And so she wishes the nursery rhyme characters that she particularly likes will come alive. And this is very difficult because they do come alive, but they're kind of half people. They don't teach, speak in proper sentences. They only speak their nursery rhyme bits, like, like Jack and Jill are forever going up the hill to fetch a um, bucket of water. And, and there's the hey diddle diddle people. And you know, if you have these people around you all the time, just shrieking out their own nursery rhymes, it drives you completely potty, as it does. So each time the children wish something, there's a little downside to it. What do you think uh, your readers, Jacqueline, will think of the original? If they have read four, and then they think, OK, well, I'm going to go and read five children. And it, uh, do you think they'll find it an easy switch? Will the language put them off? There's a, there's a, there's a bit in the book, is it smash? says, oh, the, these old-fashioned books sound very preachy. Uh, do you think they might, they might feel that? Edith Nesbitt wasn't preachy. Most of her contemporaries were. But I think, well, there's so many little extracts from Five Children in It in my book, Four Children in It. And it's really my ambition that, you know, if children read my book, think, oh, I would really love to read the original story and find out about the children in that. And I think Edith Nesbitt starts a story right at the very, um, when something exciting is going to happen. You don't have to read page after page wondering who on earth everybody is. And her characters are so realistic that I think pretty early on, after a paragraph or two, you forget that you're reading quite an old-fashioned book over 100 years old and you just get absorbed into, into that story. And did it make you want to 
do some more of hers? Are there some other E. Nesbitt books, so, some more railway children's stories? Well, it's, it's very, very tempting. I mean, I like the Samyad in this. At Well Hall today, there's some wonderful sculptures outside, and there's also one of the Phoenix, and E. Nesbitt did write a story called The Phoenix and the Carpet, and I think there's a lot of possibilities there. So you never know. Actually, you, you mentioned the, the sculptures, and later on uh, today, Jacqueline's going to be uh, unveiling some very special uh, sculptures from uh, Nesbitt's books, including the Samyad. I think we can see uh, one of the sculptures there. So, what is that? How is that? How you imagine? I, I the think the Samyad is is beautifully done, and certainly um, in the original. In Esbit story, H.R. Miller did a wonderful illustration of the Samyad, and my dear friend Nick Sharrett has drawn the way he sees the Samyad, and I think any children playing in, in these lovely gardens, if they've read Ines Bit's story, or indeed my story, they'll recognise that Samyad immediately, give him a little pat on his head. And of course, everyone reading the story, Jacqueline, is going to be thinking, Wow, if I met the Samyad and if I was granted a wish, I wonder what I would choose. And I'd be quite careful about how I asked because, you, as you've already told us, the Samyad likes to mess around with his, with his wishes. But if you were granted a wish from the Samyad, what do you think? I think I would wish for the ability to write a whole book in one day. And then, then I could just spend this one day writing a book and then all the rest of the year, I could have free to read other people's books and go out and shopping and, and do all sorts of lovely things. So I think that would be an ideal wish. What to, about you, Simon? To write, well, I'd like to write a book in a day as well. <laughs> so how long would it, how long would that have taken then? Do you speed up? Because you've written, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, you've written nearly 100 books. Do you speed up in your writing or do you slow down in your writing? Or? I think I take about the same amount of time writing books now as I always did. It takes me about six months to write a whole book and that's doing just a little bit each day but almost every day. Don't take time off at weekends or anything and and if I do it that way, writing in longhand first then typing it up on the computer, changing as I go from the very first word to the last about six months. And is it still as exciting? as it was when you were starting out? It is exciting. It's a bit worrying. I, it never um, is desperately easy. Um, I hope my books are easy to read, but they're not easy to write. But um, it's always a wonderful feeling when I actually get to the end. Uh, OK, so uh, Jacqueline is, is here. She's going to be answering as many questions as she possibly can, some from our audience here, and many of the brilliant questions which have been uh, coming in online. Uh, so we'll do some live audience and we'll do some uh, from uh, you as well who are watching. And I've got a screen full of questions here, Jacqueline. Okay. You've probably been asked these before, but these are all the great questions which people, they rarely get a chance to speak to you. So. Uh, this is the most profound question that I could find from Ollie at the Marlborough Science Academy. Do you prefer ham or cheese sandwiches? <laughs> right, that's an easy one, Ollie. <laughs> I prefer cheese. I'm not very keen on eating meat so that ham sandwiches do not appeal. Definitely cheese sandwich for me. OK. This from Kaylee at the Elm Green School. If you could have any pet in the world, any animal, what would it be? Um, that's another easy one, Kaylee, and that I love cats. I have two beautiful cats already. I have Jacob, who's coming up for four, lovely grey and white elegant cat. And I have Lily, a little kitten, who looks like Jacob's little sister. She's about six months now, just starting to go out and very, very naughty. Um, I would love more cats. I think I'm going to turn into one of those old ladies <laughs> that lives in a house with about 20 cats. That would be my idea of bliss. OK. Uh, so let's take a question from, uh, from our audience here. Who wants, uh, who wants to go first? Hi my, hi, my name's Alfie from Gordon Primary. And my question is, how do you put yourself in a child's perspective? Um, do you know, lots of people ask me this. And... Um, 
It's a bit as if I'm acting in that if you're in a school play, say, you might be, if you were doing a play of the Pied Piper, say, you might be acting the piper, you might be a rat, you might be one of the children in Hamlin, but when you're actually on the stage, you pretend to be that person. And that's all I do. I try and remember what it feels like to be an, an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old, and then I just think myself into that person, and while I'm writing, fingers crossed, it seems to work. Do you find yourself listening to the way children are speaking to you just so that you can pick up on an odd phrase? I, I don't deliberately listen to what children say, but I am around children a lot, so I suppose it, it just sort of naturally rubs off. Uh, a question from Alicia at Swain Park School. Alicia, thank you for your question. In Four Children in It, Rosalind loves uh, the book Five Children in It by Ines, but just as you did when you were young. So that she asked, did you base Rosalind's character on yourself? And you've hinted that there's a little bit of that. If so, in what ways, Alicia asks, in what ways is Rosalind like you? Uh, yes, Rosalind is definitely like me because she's quite shy, she's quite quiet. Um, I'm, I'm not so shy and quiet now, but I used to be as a child. I used to love reading. I used to pretend the characters in my favourite books were actually my friends. And um, the, the, the whole world of books was very real to me. Um, I'm not like Rosalind in that I don't have plaits. I nearly always give the girls in my books long hair, simply because I've always longed for long hair. Um, but, but we do, do have a lot in common, I think. Uh, a question from uh, a teacher. I imagine she's a teacher, Mrs Smith from Yaxon Primary School in Norfolk. Thank you. Um, I tell my class that if you want to write well, you have to enjoy reading too. You've been writing from an early age, so you must have been reading a lot as well. Who were the authors who caught your imagination when you were growing up? Um, definitely, I think, I've never met a writer who isn't a keen reader. And whenever children ask me for advice about how they can get to be good writers, I always say, read lots. And um, I, as well as Edith Nesbitt, I loved an author called Noel Stretfield. I was particularly fond of her book, Bally Shoes. And I liked lots of girly classics, like Little Women and What Katie Did and The Little Princess. And, and I read lots of Enid Blyton books, too. Um, I read, I just read everything. Sometimes I read grown-up books when I wasn't supposed to. Just. If I was at the, the breakfast table and the cereal packet was there, I'd read the back of the cereal packet. I just, when I see words, I can't help reading them. Uh, this for a question from Ume from the Valley Community School in Bolton. If you weren't an author, what would you be? I mean, I don't know if you, it's filled so much of your life, I can't imagine you'd think of anything there. Um, I think I'd like to have my own bookshop. And in fact, sometimes I, I literally have a fantasy um, idea about what I would call my secondhand bookshop and how I would arrange the shelves and um, in, in the sort of bit with animal stories, I might even have a, a rabbit in a cage, something like that. I'd try and, um, and have actual food and drink that you could have in the cookery section. I mean, I, I just have this lovely fantasy bookshop. Whether I'd make any money out of it, I don't know, but that would be my idea. Could we bring our picnics in? And eat that would be a good your, idea, uh, yes. Uh, book. Let's take another question uh, from the audience here. Who's got the, who's got the next question? Hi. Hi, my name's Cara Polkson from Gordon Primary School and I want to ask if, if, if what advice would you give to a budding author like me? Well, read lots. Also, I don't know if you've ever kept a diary, but I, I think so many people that I meet, grown-up people, say, oh, I'd love to be a writer, but I just don't have the time. And I think no matter how busy your life is, you can make time. And a good way of getting yourself into a habit of writing a little bit each day, even when you don't feel like it, is to keep a diary. So that's, that's an, another good way of doing it. And then also, when you write for yourself, you, can, you don't have to 
plan it all out beforehand and be very careful about your spelling or punctuation or anything the way you would do at school. What you can do is just think, I'm going to have fun, I'm going to write about the first thing that pops into my head and then just start writing. And that, that's the sheer joy of writing. You can write whatever you want. And did you know when you were writing this book, Jacqueline, did you know exactly how, how it was going to turn out? Did you know how it was going to finish? Or were you surprised by some of the events as they, as they turned up? On your I page? was surprised. I don't like to plan my books out too much beforehand. I knew vaguely my children were going to meet the Samyad, and I knew that he was going to grant them wishes, but I didn't know what they were going to be. And, and sometimes I even sort of surprised myself um, as I wrote. And then probably by the time I got two thirds of the way through the book, I decided that the very last wish would be something that would last forever and not be too enormous or difficult to achieve. But, so I had that plan, but um, I think the best thing of all about writing is to just let the ideas flow and, and surprise yourself. Uh, a question from Isha uh, at Tile Hill Wood School. Isha, thank you for the question. And it's a simple question, and I think people will guess at your answer. Is it fun being an author? It's great fun being an author. It's great fun on days like this when you, you get to meet lots of children and talk to many more children um, by, via modern technology. And um, it's lovely if people make a fuss of you. However, it's quite lonely sometimes because most of the time when you're a writer, you're just sitting at home writing and that's that. And sometimes you have days when it all seems to go wrong and all you're doing is writing rubbish. But then there are other days when somehow, I don't know why, inspiration strikes and you, you really love writing and can't wait to get all the words down on the page or on the screen. And then I can't imagine a job I'd sooner do. Could you tell us a little bit more about the days when it's rubbish? Because I, I imagine most people watching us now are thinking, I can't imagine how you would ever have a rubbish day. It's, it's just as hard for me, writing, as it is for anybody else, in that um, particularly getting started is really awful and you just see this, this chapter heading and then, then blank and you know you've got to fill it up yourself. But I think my, my one tip is you can always change things later, just get some words on the paper and um, even if they, you know that you're going to have to change them, at least if you've got something down, then you can hopefully work with something. But it's, it's, I, I, it's, it's very difficult to explain in that I both love doing it and yet also the moment I sit down to write, I can think of 101 things I'd much sooner do instead. Uh, Hannah from Branksom Health at Branksome Heath Middle School, I beg your pardon. Hannah, thank you for the question. Uh, did you enjoy school, Jacqueline? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Um, yes, I did enjoy some lessons. I liked my English lessons, like your literacy. Uh, I loved art. Um, and I loved playing with one or two special friends at my primary school. Um, I wasn't so keen on secondary school. Um, there were lots of rules and regulations and um, it just, I don't know, I, I, I was very willing to work very, very hard at some lessons, particularly English, but uh, pretty useless at an awful lot of other lessons. So in some ways I couldn't wait to leave school. Not a good message for school. I wish to goodness I could go back now. And um, I wish I could sit down and actually learn some history. I wish I'd paid more attention to my maths teacher. Um, I wish I'd enjoyed playing games more then. Um, so, you know, I, I miss my opportunity, I think. What sort of marks did you get for your English homework? English homework, I got good marks, but um, 
in my second, I, I got made a fuss of at my primary school, and the teachers there thought I could write quite well. Um, at secondary school, I had very inspirational and good English teachers, but they were very picky, and I never got as high a mark as I really wanted. A question from James and Reese at the Woolmer Hill School. If you could take only one thing onto a desert island, what would it be? So I imagine that's some kind of uh, a luxury item of some kind. Well, one time I, I, I was asked this on, on a radio programme, what my luxury item would be, and, and everybody expected me to choose writing materials or maybe a huge, great book to keep me going. And I'd love these, but what I actually chose was a roundabout. You know, those huge, great um, Victorian carousels that you get in fairgrounds. And um, I love these. I love when the horses are all wonderfully brightly painted. I love the old organ music. So I would sit on my horse and go round and round and round. Now let's take another question from our uh, audience here. Who's going to be our next questioner? I'm Iana from Hamo, and I'd like to know where you get your inspiration for your characters from. It's a bit like when, um, maybe when you were younger, you made up imaginary games with some of your friends, in that um, I, f I find it's quite easy to make up the characters, maybe because I was an only child and um, didn't have brothers and sisters to play with, so I always used to pretend I had particularly sisters or I pretended characters in other people's books and I just got used to doing that and um, so I can make up characters just like that. It's making up the plots to fit in round them that I find quite the difficult bit. A question from uh, Jack, who's at the Elwood Primary in Gloucestershire. What is your most memorable moment of your writing career? That's quite an interesting question because you can answer it either way. Maybe it's, it's winning an award, maybe it's uh, meeting some readers, or maybe it's a private moment with you in front of your computer. I think there are two moments that stick out for me. The one, I used to do very long, long, long signing sessions when I was quite a bit younger and quite a bit sort of bouncier. And the longest signing event of all was in Bournemouth, and it was eight hours, Goodness. which was... <laughs> eight hours? Eight How many people hours. were there? I, I think there were over 2,000 people, and it didn't finish till midnight. And half the children were falling asleep in the queue. <laughs> so that, that was an event I'll never, ever forget. But a, a more private thing, um, quite soon after the television serial Tracy Beaker started up, um, some children from a care home came to one of my events and they said that Tracy Beaker was, as a character, meant a great deal to them. And it, it, they said, you know, kids at school say, oh, you're so lucky to live in a care home. You're just like Tracy Beaker, you lucky thing. And, you know, it was great for them because in the first time in their lives, they felt really special. We are the lucky ones. And I thought, well, if just by chance my book has, has helped these children feel much better about themselves, then that's a magical bonus. And just combining that question with, with the one before about inspiration, do you remember the moment that you thought of Tracy Beaker? Do you remember where she came from? What were you doing? Were you, were you sitting looking at a blank screen and she came into your hand? I, <clears throat> I'd seen some adverts for children desperate to be fostered and I just wondered what it would be like to be in that position. And so I wrote from Tracy's point of view. Let's take another question uh, from our <coughs> audience. We have many top questions here. Who has the next question? My name is Nathan and I'm, I'm from Hamo. Who inspired you to become an author? I don't think any one person inspired me to become an author. When I was a, a girl, we didn't have author visits. And so um, you, you, you didn't really think of authors as actual people. Um, 
So initially, I think it was just books themselves, because I liked storybooks and I thought I'd like to write my own. But then as I got older, I did start to read biographies of famous authors. And I read Enid Blyton's biography, and um, I, I just thought that was quite interesting. And then I read at least one very good biography of Edith Nesbitt. And I liked, I liked the sound of her. She sounded great, good fun. Um, and uh, I just thought, yes, I, that's what I'd like to be like too. A uh, question uh, for you, Dame Jacqueline, here from Elliot, Seaview Primary in Scotland. Do you think of a title first, or do you write your story first, and then the title? It depends, I think. Sometimes um, an idea for a title comes straight into my head. Sometimes I drive my friends and family mad because I've been writing the book, it's nearly finished, and I keep saying, what on earth shall I call it? Um, so it, it, it depends. With four children in it, I knew pretty well that I had to have something in the title that showed that I was acknowledging Ines Bitt's book came first, and as Five Children It seemed a perfect title, I thought, right, okay, I, I will follow on with Four Children It. Although I've already had letters from children who didn't quite get what I was doing and said, um, you've copied, we found another book <laughs> with Five Children It in it, you copied her. And I had to write back and say, yes, I actually meant to copy her. Uh, okay, let's take another question uh, from our audience here. Who has the microphone? What's your question, please? Hi, I'm Maddie, and why would you want more cats? Why do I want more cats? Oh, Maddie, this is the thing. I'm the sort of woman that isn't content with just one thing. As you might notice, I'm not content with just one ring. I want several. Not content with one bangle. I want heaps. Um, I love books. Am I content with just a few books at home? No, at the last count I had 15,000 books all over my house and in a building at the bottom of the garden too. And so I love cats and um, I'm very proud to be a patron of Battersea Cat and Dog's Home and both my cats came from Battersea. But I have to steer well clear of Battersea unless I'm really, really determined that I can have another pet because the moment you go in there and see all those wonderful little creatures desperate for homes, I want to take them all home. Um, with me. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Let's uh, make it a question from our uh, audience here. Who has the microphone? I'm, e I'm Ellie and I like to ask, what's your favourite hobby? Ah, Ellie, well I love reading. Um, I also love swimming. There's a swimming bar that's not very far away from me and I do love to go swimming there. And, and when I sort of swim backwards and forwards, I, I've got a thing in my head now so that I can know exactly how many lengths I'm swimming, but then I can think my own thoughts too. And I make up an awful lot of my stories as I'm just going backwards and forwards. So I'm having good exercise and doing a little bit of work at the same time. So it's an ideal hobby. Do you know what you're going to do next? Uh, Book-wise? Yes. Um, I am doing an anthology about uh, cats and dogs. So this, this sort of encompasses everything that I like. Because I know what you're doing next here, because there's a picnic to be eaten. A picnic is just absolutely my favourite thing, and I'm very much looking forward to it. My tummy is starting to rumble. Yes, uh, I think everybody's is. So thank you very much indeed for all your uh, fantastic questions. It is all the time that we have uh, today. Thank you very much indeed uh, from all of us at Puffin Virtually Live. Uh, you can get your copy of Four Children and It in bookstores now. It's amazing value. Uh, the iBook uh, store has it at £3.99. This is the moment that Jacqueline has been looking forward to because she gets <laughs> some food. Obviously meeting you guys is very important, but she finally gets to have a picnic. Hopefully where you are, you're gonna have some fantastic picnic food, crisps, scotch eggs, and healthy drinks, and all that kind of stuff. But once again, thank you very much indeed for logging on, and hope you'll join us again for the next Puffin Virtually Live broadcast. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you.